I guess we're live. And welcome, Chelsea fans, to another episode of Tactical Thursdays, which we're doing on a Sunday, just for variety. And uh, yesterday, again, wasn't the best of performance, to, and to put it very mildly. Uh, but again, so we have uh, two of the best people I've met on Twitter over the past couple of years to sort of go over the match and uh, sort of make sense of the performance that we saw yesterday. And we have Chris Gag making his debut on our channel. Chris, if you be, if you the viewers haven't uh, met him before, he's one of the best people I've met on Twitter. I think uh, we've been in touch for almost three years, right from the Lampard time, and uh, one of the most balanced people who looks at football exactly the way I do and someone I enjoy talking football with. And uh, fun fact is also a coach plays center defensive midfield, and you know it, it's a position Chelsea needs for sure. So could have used <laughs> you there yesterday. And Sign thank you up. so much for coming on. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Thanks for having me, mate. Cool. And Travis making a second appearance on the channel. And again, uh, Travis is also a coach, uh, stats nerd, who got me into football analysis a couple of years back after I argued with him for almost a week that stats don't make sense. And uh, again, uh, all around awesome guy. And I'll link both of their social media links in the profile. And uh, thank you so much, Travis, for hopping on again. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Looking forward to it. And uh, so just before we start out, right, I know most of our viewers are used to us creating content in Malayalam, but uh, Glenn, thank you for tuning in. And this is uh, <laughs> Glenn from Twitter and yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you. And you're just sort of reiterating that uh, we create most of our content in Malayalam, but we are trying to branch out into uh, English as well, right? And today's stream will be in English, just, you know, uh, pu putting that out. And uh, I think... Uh, amongst all the things that we wanted to start, let's start off with yesterday, right? Let's start off with Elevent in the Room. And I'll come to you first, Travis. So uh, I think we discussed multiple aspects of it yesterday in terms of personnel, in terms of system, but where did it go wrong? I think this is, pro this is probably going to be a long-winded long -winded answer, but wanted to get your thoughts there. So. Yeah, so, I mean, yesterday was, okay, a lot of things went wrong that could have went wrong yesterday first. So that's one thing to consider. There are always going to be matches where that, like that where just things don't go your favor, the luck doesn't go your way. But I think specifically if you look at where we failed yesterday, we had a very aggressive, high, you know, high up the pitch approach. I mean, we're, the way we used our wing backs really did not have a whole lot of defensive emphasis on that, as well as the midfield just kind of seemed to not really be piecing things together, as well as in the back. I mean, you kind of had it with Cucurella was, was really bad yesterday. And I mean, this has kind of been a continual theme with him at left center back. Um, with Potter so far is that he's just not really doing well in those in, the, in, the, in those spots, the defensive areas. And I think that what you saw is really, you know, we play this very aggressive, expansive, you know, direct style of play um, when we're trying to progress towards the final third. And I think that what we saw yesterday was that can lead that over aggressive style, style of play is sometimes going to lead us to where we just have way too much in transition to defend. And we know, very well that this team struggles defending transitions um and it's just going to leave us you know run through like we were yesterday and i think really if you look at more of what's gone on in the potter era so far we've actually been overperforming quite a bit when you look at some of the under underlying metrics specifically with the defensive side so if you look at the number of saves our goalkeeper is making per game uh we're actually right now i think we're well before yesterday's so we probably got worse after yesterday we were sitting at 17th in the premier league the three teams that are near us are all relegation right now. Um, so that's how many shots per game that we were giving up for our goalkeeper to save each game. We're, we're, we're very low um, in that category. And we were, we're seeing that under Potter for a while. And now I think yesterday is where we see, okay, we're going to give up a lot of shots. We're going to give a lot of shots on target. And we're not going to have somebody really just bailing us out this time, you know, kind of that, that overperformance that we've been doing for the first nine games really – showed what I think a lot of people were expecting to see um, if we continue to do that. So that's kind of what I was thinking is that yesterday exposed a little bit of this aggressive direct style. Um, we can't defend the transitions. And we also right now just simply don't have the right personnel personnel, in my opinion, to be playing such an aggressive style with so many transitions. But um, yeah, that's kind of where I would say we failed the most yesterday was just the overall style and this over really, I mean, when we're using Pulisic and Sterling as, as you know, wing backs, so to speak, uh, I don't know if it's going to be the, there's really not a whole lot of defensive emphasis on that. So I think that if we continue to play that way with a lot of those personnels, the results we saw yesterday won't happen all the time, but it's something that's going to be within our locker because that's just the nature of that style of play. But interested to hear your guys' thoughts on that. 
Yep, I'll come straight to Chris on that as well. I think Travis made some very valid points, and we discussed mm-hmm. this, I think, uh, just before we started as well, right? You have wingbacks who are that high up the pitch, and then you have uh, players like Ukurela who are not the best aerially, and then you have uh, players like, let's say, uh, Dunk and Webster who are some of the best at playing out from the back, one of the best, some of the best at ball progression. Do you think we were naive going into the match yesterday in terms of our setup, or do you think it was just pe- people not understanding the game plan and putting it into practice there? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, t- I'll jump in. Personally, I feel like that was probably a game where far too many were changes when really, well, changes were made when really we should have been playing players in positions that they're more familiar with in a more stable formation. Um, we've not been able to rotate as much because of injuries, particularly in defence. We've had three-week game schedules now for at least two, three weeks. So you're going to start to see fatigue mental tiredness coming into games. So I think, and, and you knew Brighton were going to be bang up for it. You know, we've basically pillaged that club. I mean, if there was ever a game that we were going to come in on the back foot um, straight away before the ball had even been kicked, it was going to be yesterday. It wasn't just the the opposition. It was the whole, the whole city was probably bang up for that game. So we really needed to be mentally spot on. Um, it felt like we made far too many changes, um, far too many quirky selections. Um, personally, I think a back four, with two deeper midfielders, three across the attacking positions, and then a single striker would have been a lot better. I think that would have given us a lot more structure uh, and security and stability. I feel like there was a lot of pressure to play out from the back against the high press, which led to the first couple of goals. Thiago making some really un, un, unusual mistakes for him, but uh, you know it, it can happen. And if you're going to get if you're going to get pressed from the back in that high intensity that early. It kind of sets the tone for the game. You could kind of feel after two, three minutes the way the game was going to kind of go yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, full backs, uh, well, wing backs. I don't know if they were really playing wing backs, but basically you're playing forwards who aren't used to defending. So we were getting caught out in those wide areas. So Trevor uh, down the right was getting pulled out into that right back position far too often. That was creating gaps for the cutbacks. You know, and it was basically desperate lunge defending, which resulted in, in well, at least one own goal. We were probably lucky not to concede a couple more uh, from that kind of thing. So I think it was a game, particularly when we've got Zagreb coming up, which is a nothing game. It was a game yesterday that really needed stability rather than um, trying something different. You could do the trying out and rotating of the squad in midweek. I think yesterday we kind of knew what was coming. It was a bit naive. Um, a, approach to the game and then uh, application from the players as well. So that all kind of fed into what we what we ended up seeing yesterday. Fair point. And I think that's why, that's what I was surprised the most, right? So you have Graham Potter who's basically built Brighton from the ground up and he knows exactly what their strengths are. He knows how good Burn and Webster are at playing out. He knows how good Kaisedo is at maybe dropping deep, picking the ball up and, you know, sort of... Mm. And how good Lalana and uh, Trossard are at occupying those half spaces. And we still went and sort of played right into how they wanted to. And mm-hmm. it was a little disappointing for me. And I think that's a nice segue into the next question, right? So, Travis, again, uh, I know bo- both of us are very much affected by the Tuchel sacking. And we thought it came too fast, right? And mm-hmm. there can be multiple viewpoints on that. And totally respectful of that as well. But uh, if if you're, if we were to look at Potter's games, as, as in Potter's tenure till now in isolation... Uh, are there any factors that is, that have impressed you or do you think there are more concerns than there are positives here? So, uh, And let me just pull up a couple of stats that I have on my screen right now. So in terms of expected goals as well as big chances created, I think Chelsea is sort of 12th, 13th in the table. So mm-hmm. if our stats were to sort of even out over an entire season, you see us finishing maybe sort of in those mid-table positions, which I- ideally you know, none of us want to see happen. So again, wanted to get your thoughts there. Yeah, so I think there's been encouraging things with the Grand Potter era. Um, I think the overall way in which he's setting up and how he's wanting to, it seems to me, he's focusing more on trying to be an attacking side um, that wants to use that possession-based kind of philosophy to have more direct chance creation. Whereas what we were seeing before is really the the, the actual, you know, positions. And we're talking with two managers, Tuchel and Potter, that don't really use positions uh, as rigid things, right? We saw both managers, like, you know, like we're alluding to, like kind of the Tinkerman, right? Putting people in different spots. I think that what we're seeing though with Potter is we're putting some people in different spots, but we're still having them focus more on the aspects of the game that better fit them. And when it, kind of what we saw yesterday, and, and Chris was talking about the kind of the wing back issue, right? We had two very attached, two literal wingers 
uh, playing as our wingbacks, right? And they're going to be more involved in the attacks because of that. But that's the that's the inherent trade off there. So I, I think there are encouraging signs, right? It's almost that we are trying to have a more proactive style of play um, and, and really be more aggressive with it. And I think that that for the fans, a lot of fans like to see that after being so cautious and defensive and rigid under under Tuchel. Um, I also think that Potter is probably going to be someone that's going to get players more on board um because if what we kind of heard before with Tuchel of players maybe not buying in as much you know we we hear Potter being lauded for this emotional intelligence and we we you know I think he's giving other players more chances which is good what whether we keep those players by giving them more chances or like in the case of probably Hakeem Ziyech and Christian Pulisic where we're giving them chances to increase their, their resale value um that's where I think we're seeing positives and if he can give those players a chance um, to just simply show other people what they can do and what their value is, and then we move them on and get people that he wants. That's what I think is good. The other things that I think are good about him is we're seeing a lot of formation shifts, both between matches and even within matches, we're seeing that. And what I like about that is I think it's showing that we're seeing Potter having this ability to be tactically flexible. But what I think is important is that by being so tactically flexible, in all of these different matches and even within them, like the Man United match was a literal chess game between him and Ten Hag. He makes a move, Ten Hag makes a move, and then just value, you know, and so on and so forth. But what I think is good about that is it's going to give Potter a lot of different frames of reference to go back to at the end of this season when he really sits down and figures out what is the more, more general style of play I want to have most matches and what personnel do I need to make that happen. So I think he's probably figuring that out right now by having all of these tinkering, you know, changes in the lineups and the formations and the players and the roles. I think he's actually in real time figuring out what he's going to do long term. And then the World Cup, I think that's after the World Cup. It's probably when there's going to be a little bit more focus on a set style of play that has some changes, but not as many changes. And I think that after we you know, move players on this summer there's a really good reason to think that he's going to have a good system because he's already kind of changing and shifting things a lot. Um, there are concerns though, uh, without a doubt. I think there are some concerns because it is a very expansive open style of play. Um, but I think overall what I'm seeing is basically a guy figuring out what he's going to do long-term by trying different things. Um, so I think that that's actually pretty encouraging. And today is just one of those, or yesterday was one of those types of results that you're not going to get them all right. And, you know, like Chris was saying, that Brighton crowd was like pissed from the very beginning. And it was one of those, you know, and Potter created that team, but conversely, they were created by Potter. So they kind of know what to expect playing against him. Fair point. And I, I think you touched on a lot of things there, right? I think. Uh, but I, again, I, I did want to see maybe uh, in the first half, we saw things weren't working in terms of how much space we were conceding out wide. And Chris, I think... Uh, I'll probably direct this next question to you. Uh, in terms of how Potter wants to play, I think uh, we voiced this concern even before he came to Chelsea in terms of uh, you, m multiple games against City and Liverpool last season. They, did, they didn't show even the slightest bit of hesitation to push bodies and attack, right? He, you had uh, even the, your wide centre-backs pushing up and then pressing. And it was basically leaving maybe two to three bodies if there was a turnover. Do you think that's a sustainable... You know, style of play, at least for, you know, if we were try to try to re replicate that at Chelsea and e even if we were to say, let's let's say, e even if we were to go ahead and sign Declan Rice and uh, multiple other players who would, uh, you know, make us more robust or more mobile in the middle of the park, do you think Potter, Potter will still have to maybe try and tone down on uh, those aspects of his system? There, so? I think there's a balance to, to everything. I think we've seen many managers, um, even in the last five years, try and take teams on with that over aggressive uh press and and kind of gun ho approach we saw sarri try it at city and we got heavily hit six nil um we saw frank try it a few times you know we got we got rolled over by man united on the opening day of the season four nil we've seen well probably tuchel didn't really try it too much i think tuchel was probably in my my one big criticism of him was it was always the same and not enough changes were made it was almost too stubborn um, I think with with Graham Potter, it's my concern is that we are going into games and you're doing all of this pre-game prep and you you've got your you've got your team around you and you think, right, who we got this week? We've got this team, let's get the guys out. And it doesn't feel like we've got a starting eleven and tactics right now for the last four or five games. 
Um, I was at the Villa game. Um, you could see after about 20, 25 minutes, he wasn't right. He was having to make formation changes to kind of patch over the holes and then make changes at half time. We looked a bit more secure. Kepler was phenomenal that day. I think that goes back to what Travis was saying earlier about shots saved. You know, another day we probably three, four, one down there. That could quite easily have been another Brighton game, to be honest, with the way that first half went. Um, so I think it's good that he's exploring different options. It's not his team. He's got a lot of injuries in defence as well, which probably doesn't help. He's probably thinking, probably going to have to go and attack players a little bit, teams a bit more because I haven't got the resources to contain contain teams. Um, you know, we've got uh, Kante out long-term injury. We're kind of managing a calf injury with Kovacic at the moment. We're kind of having to overplay players in in midfield. So he's probably trying to trying to find ways of getting results out of games or getting positive results out of games in a way that he probably wouldn't normally do. So I'll give him that kind of benefit of the doubt. But I definitely feel there's a balance between, um, you know, trying to figure out how you can get the best out of your team without overchanging things too much. I feel like you just kind of create chaos, um, you know, changing the team and the setup and the formation three times during the game. I, it's not a long-term sustainable uh, game plan for me. No. So I, I, I take Travis's point. He's probably thinking, right, we'll get through to the we'll get through to the World Cup break. We'll have a transfer window, and we'll see if we can start putting a real stamp on this um, stamp on this team. In, in regards to future signings, you know, look, midfield is is the priority, and for sure, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and and it's to the point now where it doesn't matter how much money it is for particular players. You know, you'll see a lot of people saying, well. 100 million is probably too much. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, you see City have the, the courage to go out there and just pay whatever it is that they want for the players that they want. And, you know, they implement the game style and the system that they want and look at where they are. So we're in that kind of territory now uh, where we really are having to, to, we'll have to go and keep doubling down on this investment. So I hope the owners are up for it. It seems like they are. Um, you know, they've brought, they've brought Potter in. Uh, many people questions bringing him in after spending 200 million quid under Tuchel. You know, they've made a bold decision. So let's see. Let's see what we can do um, it, it, over January. But we've got some tough games coming up now, particularly in the league. So I really think it's kind of less experimenting. You can experiment City away in the Cup. You can experiment against Zagreb in the Champions League. Not a problem. But when it comes to the league games, you've got Arsenal. Newcastle's going to be a horrible game, by the way. Um, we've really got to make sure that we're we're at it. We've got the right players in the, in the best kind of formations to kind of handle two in two informed teams, basically. Um, so those those are the key priorities for me in the next few weeks. A bit more stability, focus on getting six points if we can in the league, and then we'll take some stock and see where we are from there. Japan. Just before we take this question from George as well, right? So, uh, I think Nick from that Chelsea podcast made a very valid point recently on the TL where he said there's just too much football going on. You can't expect players to play like three, four games in in a week and then come back and perform at the same level, right? And there's obviously going to be muscle injuries, soft tissue injuries, and whatnot. Uh, and do you think this season should be an outlier in terms of we don't draw too many conclusions till you know the World Cup gets over and the schedule evens out, or? Do you think it, it's it's fair for us to expect the sort of consistency that City is putting up there? I think it's unrealistic if you expect that consistency, to be honest. You can all have your vision and idea of what you want from your club. And we all fundamentally, um, no matter how wildly different our opinions are, we all fundamentally want the team to be successful. Yep. Um, but you're not going to achieve that with the amount of turmoil uh, that we oh, sure, that we've yeah. had. You know, mm-hmm. um, you, you know, we literally had the, the shops shut last season uh you know nothing was working you can't just literally go from that and and carry on we can hope and we can expect it because of the stature of the club and the players that we've got but and we might well get fourth this season but we might not and i think we've probably just got to accept that that's a possibility uh one season is okay it's happened to us before um as long as we're putting in the building blocks for a, a for sustainable success moving forward i think we've just got to accept that this season could be below par too bad, too. Um, but I think if my personal view is if I can see progress um, I can live with that my my worry would be is if we see another four or five of those kind of performances yesterday later on in the season I'd probably start worrying about what we're we actually doing and what I don't want is more ch- ch- chopping and changing I want this to work I want every manager to work but I feel like this really does need to kind of work because this is 
this was the base model that the new owners have kind of bought in and this is their man. Um, so we shall see. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's very, very much a case of you can hope, you can expect, but you've got to be realistic. I think the point that Vignesh is making in the comments right now around Arsenal, if we rewind the year and we look at how bad Arsenal were, right? they were clueless on the ball, off the ball towards the start of last season. They barely uh, resembled a football team. I think there was this one game against City where Jaka got sent off, if I'm not wrong, and then multiple other games. We beat them 3-0 with Lukaku scoring. Uh, one player I definitely want to try and forget. And we have a legend in the comments, Chris, so <laughs> feel free to f- feel free to kick things off with him right here. So, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> Just ignore him and move on. Honestly, absolute wet wipe. Cool. Shout out to Pawan. Great, great guy. And we probably, hopefully, have him on the stream soon. Don't waste uh, your time. If you want if you want a decent stream, don't bother. Oh, God. I have to feel feel bad for my brown brother right there. So yeah. uh, and I think, yeah, same, same point. And I think, Travis, you'll agree as well that Arsenal looked shit. And, and, and that's putting it mildly a couple of seasons back. And... If you look at Potter right now, at least in the first few games in the UCL, we did show some patterns of play, some idea in how to progress it from the back. And at least for me personally, I'm invested. I'll see where this goes. I don't, I don't want uh, you know to see too much hopping and changing in terms of uh, management at least. But yeah. uh, is there one thing that would sort of set you off and say, you know, th- we this is one point beyond which I don't want to see this experiment being carried on? So. Well, I mean, there's always going to be an extent where that, that is going to be... St- a possibility, right? If we're getting beat and beaten and battered, you know, four times out of five for two months, right, in a row, I think that's when you can kind of say this, the the base of the short term is not even viable. So how can we have a viable long term if we're not even seeing, you know, across two months span, anything like that? So, of course, there's going to be a limit to it. I, I'm not really ready to pull the plug. I, I really am just kind of one of those guys. I, I will back the manager until the very end. That's just how I've been. The only guy I've really wanted out of management from a spot that we've had was probably with Rafa Benitez. Um, it's probably the last time it, I actually it, wanted somebody Villas out. Villas-Boas for me. I wanted him out. Who was it? Villas-Boas, I, I wanted him out. <laughs> I didn't want him anywhere near the club. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, so I, I tend to definitely stick by him a lot more. And I think with Potter... I think he fits a lot of what we need long term. I think if he can get us to play anywhere like Brighton, we're playing right, and then you give him a lot more money, a better sporting structure, you know, better players, and you know, better players can execute better systems. So, again, I think that there's a lot, there's more to be encouraged by with this era. Um, despite you know, even I was somebody who was very bitter um, and disappointed by by Tuchel being gone, and it's in, it's funny that you mentioned Arsenal. Right. This is kind of now the the template of, you know, if you want to suffer for the short term to have a long term future with a manager and everybody points to Arsenal, what that looks like. You know, one of my like one of my good friends is an Arsenal fan. And, you know, kind of the thing that he told me a lot was even with Tuchel, when the when the results were kind of starting to dip is that, you know, at the end of the day, if you're going to build anything long term, you're going to have to stick with him and let him get his own team in. And and you could argue that this summer was an, was moving towards that, but we really didn't give any chance for that to be realized. Um, so I, I think that if we are going to continue with Potter, I, even if we don't get top four this season, I don't think we get rid of him. I, I, I just, it's not his team. He came in mid season in some ways. It's sort of like an interim job. Um, if you want to think of it that way, because he's a mid season change, you know, and you don't really place crazy expectations on an inter- interim person um, when it's formally interim. But I understand in this case, it's a little different. But my, my point being that given the circumstances of how Potter came in, if if we get even if we get fifth or sixth this season, we're just going to have to live with that and let the guy build. And because if we if we do ditch Potter now after this season for not getting top four, we're just going right back to square one exactly. to start all over again. So there's, we really, there's no point anymore to do this chronic chop change. I I don't think that we can ever compete with Man City unless we get closer to a model like them. And that that will involve keeping the right guy in place for the right amount of time, which is not going to be 12 to 18 months. I think we're going to have to start seeing longer term stuff. And I I mean, I think there's been enough encouragement so far with Potter. Um, But, you know, kind of like what Chris was saying, like Newcastle's coming up. Arsenal is coming up. the The competition for the top four is probably the best it's been in a, quite a while. Mm-hmm. Um, Newcastle look like a top four side. They they look amazing. Yeah, the results are there. They look good. The performances are good. 
So the competition is very stiff this year for the top four. And if, if we miss out, we miss out. But if, if people want long-term projects, then they had to, you know, if that's what everybody screams for, then we have to live with that and not get pissed when, you know, if or when we don't get top four, I think we have to stick, stick by the manager and see what he can do over a two year period. Hmm. Makes yeah. perfect sense. I think yep, we've sort of touched on the you know long term project side of things, and uh, I think we can probably delve a bit deeper into the specifics, right? I do nerd out with you guys on tactics all the time. So, uh, and Chris, I'll come to you first. Uh, Christian Pulisic, <laughs> Pulisic within the, <laughs> one of Chris's favorite players, if people don't know. And again, uh, in in this specific system, right? I'm a little reluctant to sort of write him off completely because. <clears throat> We saw how it went with Robin, right? He was per perpetually injured, but whenever he was on, he did show more quality than uh, Pulisic for sure. Hmm. But but in this current system, do you think there's a place for him to eventually grow into a sort of wide attacker? Or do you think we sort of cut our losses and then uh, did this experiment? And I ask this specifically because Potter did give him a couple of chances as a wide attacker, but he's now being started being back and it isn't working out. People back into him, he falls over. And it, it's pretty frustrating and a lot of people have made... Uh, similar points right so just wanted to get your thoughts on that yeah i think I'll, I'll go i'll go a step back further and i think a lot of our problems with attackers comes from the fact that we've not addressed the midfield position Makes properly sense. so we overcompensate a lot in defense so we've been playing with a back three wing backs and a lot of our attack actually comes down from from wing backs and we kind of play with inside forwards to which Pulisic isn't an inside forward. Neither is Mason Mount, by the way. Uh, just to, to just to add that, so we're kind of putting our we're putting play, you know, and Kai's not a centre forward. You can kind of just start seeing you kind of you've got attackers, but you're not really utilising them in their positions. Um, so that's what we've currently had for the last eighteen months, two years. But let's not forget, Pulisic has been here for four years now. This is his fourth season. So yep. you, you know, if it, I I've got a problem not necessarily with uh, him per se. Um, I think his attitude's not great. I think he's mm -hmm. quite weak mentally. I think, um, mm -hmm. and I think if things aren't going right for him, um, then he kind of projects that outwardly. Uh, I can imagine it kind of being an outward projection. And just even him. as an American, Chris, I feel the yeah. same way as you do. Like the yeah. whole book and all this stuff. It's like yeah. you're you're not even in the prime of your career, and you're like writing like autobiographies. Oh, yeah, twenty four years old. You're writing a story about your career, and you know you you, you see him you see him throwing wobblies, and you know he gets he gets bullied out of games a lot. I think yes, he's got some he's got some obvious talent about him. You know, he's he's a good dribbler. I think he makes the wrong decisions quite a lot. I think he either For holds sure. on the ball too long or he plays yep. the wrong pass. So I don't think he necessarily plays with his head up a lot. Um, so I've got a lot of criticisms about him in terms of what he does on the pitch, but also in terms of um, sort of his mentality. I don't think it's quite the right fit. And I don't think, you know, this isn't a one year, two year or half a season kind of uh, sample that I've looked at. It's, it's, it's nearly four seasons now. He's, his contract yeah. is up end of next year. So we're, in, we're actually in a decision process now of, are we actually going to give this guy another contract or are we going to just move him on? Um, personally, for me, I think him and Ziet both need to be moved on. They've, they've not worked. Um, I think it would be better for all parties. I think we need to really have a look at our, our forward options. But it, it all stems back to me from if we can get the right people in the midfield sorted, it gives you more flexibility then. You can play with the two, really at the moment. We can't really play with the two because we just lose that midfield back to completely. Um, you know, we haven't got that physical presence, especially without Kante. And, and even with Kante back now, he's, he's he's not what he was. He's still probably our exactly. best midfielder, but he, he's not what he was and we can't rely on him. Um, so we really need to address that midfield position out. And if we can do that, I think that will then allow us to play um, forwards in their actual positions. You know, playing... People can criticise Sterling. Yes, he's been off form, but he's not a wing back, or or, or whatever sure, version yeah. of whatever version of a wing back uh, Potter was using him in uh, yesterday and, and a couple of games ago. That's not what he signed him for. That's not what he's built his career around. So mm -hmm. why you know it's it's frustrating that we're having to do that um, still. Um, but look, I think personally for me, I think it's probably time to say that the Pulisic experiment didn't work. We give it a good go. It's probably better for him to go. I think he probably Travis, you'll know more than I will. I think I think he needs to go somewhere where he's he's the big fish. 
uh, in a smaller pond maybe where he feels loved and he can a team kind of gets built around him and I think he'll probably flourish uh, in those environments. I don't think this environment uh, kind of works for him or suits him. And I don't yeah. necessarily think the English game suits him either. I, I think you're right on that. because I mean, I've been saying even myself, I think it's time for him to leave Chelsea. And I've been saying that as far back as last season. Mm. And, I, and I really think that you hit the best things, of, you know, kind of the best reasons for why. We see flashes. We've seen the talent. Mm. He's more of a goal scoring winger, but you you hit the nail on the head. He has this ability just to put his head down and dribble and not pick his head up. Mm. And that's not going to work at like the top high end, you know, elite clubs of the world. That's just not going to be the winger that works there. Mm. And you're right about the the big fish in a small pond, because when you think about how he's been brought up in America, mm. I mean, the guy has basically been the biggest fish. And despite us having 350 some million people in this country, we don't have that many soccer stars and never really have because we're still growing the game. And the game has exploded in the last 10 years over here in the mm. States. And he has really been the face of that, you know, kind of revolution over here. Mm. And I think there's so much media attention. There's so much fan attention here in the States on him that you're, that you're spot on when you say that he needs to be in a, situation at the club level that probably more resembles what he's used to back home and the way mm. he's treated here because at Chelsea right now he's he's just another guy at this point mm. he really is he's just a, just another guy and I, I don't really see him making a difference I don't think it's going to work no. his only real form was under Lampard um, yeah. that was really the only time we saw consistently good form was under Frank mm. and with these with these you know back three different setups with the different managers, it's not working. So I, I, I do I, I do think it's probably the end of the experiment. I agree with you. It's, it's probably best for all parties to move them on at this point. Hmm. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. And yeah, I think Pawan came up with a great question. Chris, I don't know if you'll agree. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think he says that if we, if we address midfield, right? And uh, I, I think that it all goes down to how good players in midfield are defending space. I know yeah. a lot of people don't particularly rate Jorginho too much, but for me, at least on the in, in, in European games, in where the pace of the game lets him do what he does best in terms of break lines of fun and then, you know, uh, organize people around him. I think the European game suits him really, really well. But And I think Chris has made that point multiple times. Travis has as well. Branchy, I think, made it... Uh, I, th I remember discussing this with him when I met him in Abu Dhabi that in European games, Jorginho is class, but put someone yeah. like a Delhi Alley on top of him for an entire half, or you tell Aronson to press the shit out of him like he did at Leeds, then he will struggle. And th that's not a slight on the player, it's just a fact of mm. uh, his physical attributes and his limitations, right? Mm. And we've been arguing the same, you know, s sort of around the same lines for over three, four seasons now, that we need a significantly more robust, you know, presence in midfield. For me, uh, Rice would be class, and my, the only concerns I have are that West Ham simplify build up a lot, right? So, the out ball mm -hmm. to the wide players is always there, and e even in England, I think uh, Southgate system limits Rice in a lot of ways because they don't do stuff, you know. Uh, and Chris, I think I, I don't know how big of a Southgate fan you are, but I think Southgate holds that England squad back in in a lot of ways. There are so many players who are class in there who are not allowed to fully express themselves. Yeah. So, in terms of midfield. Uh, and Travis, I'll come to you first again. Uh, do you do you think it makes sense for us to explore options outside of Declan Rice if our primary objective is to let other people express themselves? So there's talk of Enzo Fernandez, multiple other names being bandied about, right? Do we explore those or do we just say we want the best midfielder in the Prem and we want him and we'll break the bank no matter how much it costs there? So, yeah. I, so I think this is what I've said for a while is we really need a succession plan for both Conte and Jorginho. And they really have very competing skill sets that drastically differ. And that's why I think we need Rice, I think more addresses the Conte side of that succession. But I think we also still still do need somebody that has Jorginho's profile because we played that way for so long, as well as the manager we have in charge is going to be probably wanting somebody that's more of a tempo setter, more of a controller in that midfield. And I think that's a for what I, I mean, I really like that aspect of the game, right? Right. Somebody that's always going to be able to slow or speed up, um, right. One thing that we do see with Jorginho that is kind of the women, like the liability of him is just in transitions. That's where he can be beat. And when people create those midfield overloads to specifically target Jorginho out of matches, it works. And I think that if we can have somebody that's a little bit more capable of 
you know, dealing with those things alongside like a Declan Rice or something like that. That's what I think we need to do. Now, who that player might be is tough to say because there aren't very many Jorginho replacements out there and there aren't very many Conte replacements out there. But I I think we need to make two big moves in the midfield. And then I think if we have a midfield of four of, you know, let's say just hypothetically, you've got a Declan Rice style uh, midfielder to come in and replace Conte. You maybe get a similar style, maybe a lesser known guy that you can mold into more of a Jorginho role. Then you still have Mount, you still have Kovacic, you still have Gallagher. That's a midfield I feel a little bit more sure about going forward. Because I think that we're seeing right now is Jorginho and Conte, they're, they can still do a job, they can still get by, but they definitely, I think, in my opinion, they're starting to age out of the squad. I think that's kind of where we're at with them. We're starting to see that, that aging out process. And we're going to have to replace them. Both of them have been very, you know, key members of our squad for years now. So it's going to be a tough challenge. I think, I I think breaking the bank for if we do have to go for Declan Rice and that's who the manager wants, then I don't have any problem with that. I think that's what you do. You give him the manager what he wants. And if he wants a hundred million pound Declan Rice, then I would feel very confident saying that there's a plan for that 100 million pound player to come into the team immediately and change things. So if that's what he, if that's what managers want, go do it by all means. I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to the move. There aren't that many amazing midfielders that I can think of that are going to come in and transform our team. He is probably one of them. He would allow us to play differently. And I think the only concern is what you said uh, is that the fact of the matter is that West Ham, the buildup structure is completely different than what it is at Chelsea and how Declan Rice would be able to adapt to those kind of differences would be the key thing. But I don't think he's a player that just, is incapable of adapting. I mean, I, I, I just think that that is probably overstated a lot um, because look at how we've seen even the players that we currently have. They've all adapted between Sari to Frank to Tuchel to, to now Potter. They've all shown the ability to adapt and still get results. And I don't see why somebody of, of Rice's nature wouldn't be able to do that as well. See, exactly. The comment we paid hundred million for Lukaku, right? So we paid hundred million for Rice. It wouldn't be that bad compared to Lukaku. Sure. <laughs> and uh, Chris, your thoughts again, and I know how strongly you feel about the defensive midfield position. Both of us are Mark Lele fans as well. Uh, yeah. And I do want similar seal in midfield as well, right? So j- just your thoughts. Do we break the bank for Rice? And do you have any concerns about on-the-ball quality and stuff like that? Um, all right. So I'll just so I'll just rewind it again. So I think um, you see the game at the San Siro. Uh, AC Milan, Giorgino was superb in that game. Mm-hmm. He's used to Italy. He's used to that kind of pace of game. Um, and he can really control and dominate games. Um, that is a skill set that I think we can still use uh, in a squad. Um, so, you know, his contract's up at the end of the season. So is Kante. His Kante will be 32. Giorgio will be 31. I'd probably... I'd probably give Jorginho a new contract, but it would have to be on the basis that he, it is a reduced role. So if he's accepting okay. of if he's yep. accepting of that, I think there's a space for him. Um, you know, because look, we are going to be in European competition. He doesn't get injured a lot. He is a leader. I think he's quite a good person uh, within the squad from the sounds of things in terms of what he brings in and around the pitch. So. The, but the problem is he, he's he he gets marked out of games far too easily, bullied off the ball far too easily uh, in the Premier League, and you cannot carry him um, in in certain games. You just can't. You can having you can have him come on at certain points in in games to kind of wrestle back a bit of control or tempo yep. and stuff like that. No problem. But you cannot you cannot carry him week in week out. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, so that's just my little. Bit on Georgie in terms of do you get Deck and Rice? Um, for me, yeah, I think there's two there's two midfielders that are worth breaking the bank for. Um, Declan is one of those. I've got no problems with his ability to adapt and um, and build up play in a different way to what he's being asked to do under David Moyes at West Ham. They've got a very specific playing style because Moyes has set them up in a very specific way. So he does that and he does that really well. He comes and plays in a in a in a in a two sixes system with England. 
no problem either there. You know, he gets asked to do something different with Southgate than he does with West Ham and he does it yep. and he does it well. What he is, is he's a great ball carrier. You know, you only yep, have to watch sure, a yep. selection of West Ham games and you see that this guy breaks lines. Whereas um, in our midfield at the moment, we basically, we shuffle the ball around and we try and we try and build overlapping positions out wide. And that really works when we've got our wingbacks, uh, Reese and, and Chile on form and fit. That's when our systems look really well. But we can't, we can't, the only player that really kind of tries to do that is Kova through the middle. Yeah. Uh, but even then, he kind of gets so far, and then that ball gets shuffled out wide. Or you, you know, he might try. He does. He probably doesn't try that one-two exchange um, in and around the in and around the eighteen-yard box too much. Whereas, you know, Declan is, is a powerhouse. He's an athlete. Yep. Um, he's quick. He's strong. He's better on the ball than people give him credit for. He's got a good sure, range yeah. of passing. He's young, so he's only going to get better. Um, you know, and he's going to be playing with. You know, and no disrespect to West Ham, he's going to be playing with players at a much higher level, and your your yep. game will naturally improve as a result of that. So, look, do you do you? I don't, and I think it will probably be a little bit less than 100 million, to be honest, because I think his contract is winding down. But let's just say, for argument's sake, it is 100 million. I wouldn't have any problems um, making that purchase whatsoever. The other one I would look at, if if for whatever reason we can't get Declan, is Bellingham. Um, you know, if you're close, talking about close, if you're Isaac. Yeah, if you're talking about statement midfield signings, and, and even one of these two guys, you basically sign in for the next 10 years. So you've got your midfield unit sorted for the next 10 years because of their age profile. Um, Bellingham is, is a phenomenal football player. Really, you know, levels. Scored yesterday too. I think he scored yeah. yesterday as well. So yeah. You know, that education that he's getting over in Dortmund. And, and he's and he's not just that. He's becoming a leader over there as well. I'm pretty sure he's been captain recently as well. You know, he's, start, he's now got into the England uh, first choice 11. Um, um, so, you know, he's, he is a quality. The thing is, uh, people, people, I'm going to say that. I know he said it as a joke. But look, just because good players are English at the moment doesn't mean that we shouldn't be speaking about having For sure. yeah. you know yeah. but, uh, at the end of the day uh, you only have to look at the England national team you know we probably underperformed in the last two tournaments because of how Southgate applies that but our squad is through the roof our, our system I think Kane is probably the best number nine in the world for me at least if not if not one of the best yeah. you know <laughs> one of the best if not the best um, you know our, our football structure in this country that we've implemented 30 years ago is starting to see fruition now and the money that we're putting into academies and stuff like that we are churning out talent after talent after talent you know you, it, 15 years ago there was you, you'd have to go in the media and you could find any story that was saying we're really worried about where our actual talent is coming from. We've got mm. such a small sample group of English players playing in the Premier League. But now not only have we got a bigger sample of English players playing in the Premier League, but we've got players playing abroad. Um, and that's helping our football our football education. So look, you know, you see it on Twitter a lot, or, or, you know, Brexit, Yerdas, whatever. It's just nonsense. At the end of the day, these are quality players. And if you can honestly go and tell me and show me where there's two better centre midfielders that would be suitable for Chelsea, then those two people, I'll have that conversation with you. But I've, I've, I've remained to be convinced that there is two better options out there. I think you get one and then somebody else. I don't think you realistically get two. So, uh, you know, if you're going to make a statement looks like in the midfield. There's yeah. going to be a ton of people trying to get Bellingham next season, right? So I think that might be a bidding mm -hmm. war for him, but either yeah. would be great. And, and yeah. again, I, I watched Rice since Frank Lampard pushed for him, right? And back yeah. then I was like, go for it. We have yeah. to do it, and uh, I think o over time, because we changed systems, and then we started playing with those two sixes. Mm. Yeah. Few, bit of concern, but I think Chris's point is extremely valid. He's improved almost every season exponentially on how good he is on the ball, right? And for him to adapt to something at Chelsea, I don't think it's going to be too much of a stretch. I think we've yeah. covered uh, the midfield side of things as well. Just just want to get your thoughts on this, Travis. Uh, Ruben Loftus stick. I I get a lot of stick on this channel for this because I. Regardless of how many mistakes he make, makes, right? I always have these mental gymnastics to try and sort of show that Ruben loftus cheek is good enough to play for Chelsea. But yesterday, I think, was pretty bad. He was marginally better in the second half, played right back, carried the ball well. But, you know, the standards that, that there are at Chelsea, I don't think he has cut it for a long time. And multitude of factors, injuries and whatnot. Do you think we still keep him next season in terms of a utility player? Or do you think it's time for us to maybe say goodbye and, you know, cut our losses on that side? I mean, so I don't, I, without knowing his contract situation in terms of, you know, wages and all of that, what I think that, you know, okay, yeah, yesterday might expose, you know, Ruben a bit, but to, to ignore the fact that he has been shuffled across in almost, almost every position you can think of from center back to wing back 
to holding mid to more of a, you know, he's played striker in his career. He's played winger. He's played almost everywhere on the pitch except for goalkeeper. What I think that that really, ha- I mean, that's, that's an incredible amount of utility at, within the squad that I think is worth retaining because not only does he play all of those roles, but more times than not, we don't see the performances we saw yesterday from Ruben. We see a little bit more consistent baseline with some flashes that, you know, go way above that and show a talent ceiling. But I don't think yesterday's performance is indicative of, you know, the fact that he, some people that might say he's not Chelsea qualities. I don't buy that. He's already shown that he can put in quality performances with Chelsea. Um, and I think that he is more than willing to accept squad roles. He doesn't throw a throw a fit about playing in different positions or different roles. He does that. He, and he does it, you know, adequately enough to continue to be picked for that. And simply to know if we have injuries strike, RLC is able to be shuffled around anywhere to help compensate for those injuries. And yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I actually don't see any reason to get rid of the guy at all. I, I don't, I think that that level of utility, how well he handles it professionally and mentally to just know he's not ever going to be the guy, but he is going to be called upon that. That's something that I think is very underrated and I don't want to compare him to other players in the past that we've had, you know, that maybe come on like an Obi Mikel, right. Or somebody that just, you know, knows their role, doesn't have a huge, you know, starting 11 presence, but knows their role and does really well with it. I think RLC does that so well. And I mean, he's been with the club for so long. He understands it. You know, he, I think he understands what it's supposed to be like here at Chelsea, what the standards are X, Y, Z. So I don't see any reason to get rid of him. I actually thought yesterday, despite how bad it was, it wasn't like he was the only one that was bad, if we're being honest. Oh, sure. It was a collective mm-hmm. collective failure yesterday. It wasn't just one player yeah. causing that result. Yeah. Yep. And fair point. I'm definitely happy to see someone backing me up on RLC. Thank you, Travis, for that. Uh, and Chris, again, I think we discussed this before the stream, uh, stream as well, right? And mm. uh, probably some very divisive topic. And I'm not basing this off Twitter because it's a shit show on there and you know, like you mentioned, it's it's not a place anyone who wants to have a serious football conversation should take too seriously. <laughs> yeah. But for me, I think uh, in terms of Mason Mount, right, for him to put up the numbers that he has at this age over the last couple of seasons is phenomenal. I think uh, I can't think mm. of too many youngsters in Chelsea history have done that bar Hazard. But mm. uh, in in terms of workload management as well as I think there's a few attributes he has to improve on, right? And it's fair he's a very young player. When he gets the ball in and around zone 14 or uh, you know the number 10 position, as we say, he there's a couple of instances where his decision making could be better. But again, uh, don't want to be too harsh on him. But mm. even in terms of workload management for a kid that young to be playing this often, I don't want to see him burn out in a couple of years, right? Do you yeah. think creative midfield is one position we look at in terms of we've been linked with Sergio Milinkovic, Savic, and multiple players of that ilk? I think Zakarian from Zenit is one player we've tracked. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you think that's a priority, or do you think we persist with Mount and, they, and then sort of say in a couple of years he will he, he will hit world world class you know levels? Because I think he's well on the way there right now. Yeah, I, I, again, I think it's important to say that he's basically been playing out of position for the last three years. For you know? sure. he, he said in a recent interview that he's he's a box to box eight. You know, um, so and I think the common theme here is if we can get our midfield sorted, we can change how we play. We can change our structure and our setup, and we can start playing uh, players in their actual positions. Um, Havertz is is probably one of our. You know, he's he is already that kind of creative midfielder, but we're utilizing him in positions as well where he's not. You know. We, He's not a centre forward, but we're kind of relying on him to play up there. Um, you know, if you could start using him in, in a 10 more regularly, uh, that we'd probably see more from him. I'm, I'm not convinced. Uh, uh, again, I think, you know, jury's still out with him. But, you know, I think we've probably, I don't think we need to heavily invest in that kind of 10 position. I think, I think it really does come all the way back to get that midfield right. And then we can address the forwards a, a, a bit more. I think we kind of just need Potter to buy forwards that he wants and he uses so we can start building his team um because the guys that we've had in there they've kind of not really worked um but in terms of mason look he's 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 played a lot of football yep. and he's carried he's carried us at times um you know in the last 18 months two years you know the numbers he put together last season okay look some of the goals were bunched up against um you know teams where we'd, we'd kind of won the match or whatever but I'm not sure what people really want from him. You know, he's he's uh, he's an excellent set piece taker. 
that does count by the way you are allowed to score goals from set pieces and um you know that's that's a skill set that you know you only have to look at the years that we suffered watching William not being able to beat the first man from the corner um you know good set pieces are hard to take as are hard to find he you know his energy off the ball is 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 ridiculously good his work rate off the ball his physicality you know he gets in people's faces he you know he, he people feed off of that you know it's all the intangible stuff you can have a look at what he does on the ball could he be better in certain circumstances of course he could but as you said Akash, he, you know he's still young you know he's what 23 sure. um look his contract's up at the end of next season we need to get that nailed down asap this guy is key key for this football club kim reese the the, the key players uh of real quality that we've produced um you, you know, uh, yes, we could get more out of him in other areas of the pitch, and I think we will do in time. But you know, you, you know, well, I don't, the stuff that you see about him is is ridiculous in a lot of ways. You know, and and the other way as well. I think people go too far the other way in terms of promoting him and stuff Johnny like that. Mm -hmm. things over. Uh, you know, people. <laughs> but the thing is, things like, people like that don't help. Uh, they don't help the <laughs> yep. situation. Um, you, you, you know, at the end of the day, he is a phenomenal football player who has been brought up under the Chelsea DNA, who has contributed more than most players have done for us in the short space of time he's been with us. He's only 23. He's got another 10 years at the top. He's only going to get better. Um, you know, it, just just enjoy him. That's all I would really say. You've got to enjoy players like that. And that's kind of what, kind of the point of supporting a, a club is, right? You exactly. see players through the home grain system coming through and, and doing well and winning major tournaments, scoring major goals, setting up major goals. It, it, that's kind of what it's about, right? So I don't really get what, I don't get the the negativity that yep. is attached to yep. it. It ruins there. my yeah. experience of following games at times because the yeah. minute someone makes a mistake, I know I'm going on to Twitter and then I'm seeing these 100 tweets come up, highlight, mm -hmm. highlighting and overanalyzing one tiny aspect of games, right? And yeah. I think Travis has said this as well. It sort of ruins the entire experience of uh, following a game. Mm -hmm. messes my head up at times and Travis again just want to get your thoughts here as well uh, if you know the objective is to say you know win a Premier League within the next couple of years I think that we might need a bit of investment there right because I, I'll just put up the numbers here Bruno Fernandes regardless of all you know uh, we, we, we poke a lot of fun at him and say 78% pass completion rate and whatnot but he puts up close to 100 chances a season Averages maybe 10 15 assists yeah. a season there. Trent Alexander Arnold gets ribbed every day on Twitter, but he put up 98 or 99 chances from open play, not sorry, not from open play across the season there. And KDB does that as well. Mm -hmm. If you know, and Chelsea as a team currently does not do that, we rely too much on individual players or on our wing backs to provide creativity, which is unfair. So, do you think, uh, you know, would you be in the favor <laughs> of investment in terms of the creative midfield profile, or do you think we're good to? Well, I mean, I think that on the surface, probably so. Um, I think we can maybe favor that, you know, maybe if we eventually sort that out with other signings and move them out back. I mean, that that's a whole other dynamic yet to be explored. But I think it does. I think, you know, a lot of people argue that we haven't ever replaced Nemanja Matic. And I would that's agree. True. And I would also argue that we've never replaced Cesc Fabregas. And I think it shows a lot of times we don't really have we, I mean, Jorginho does it sometimes, but it's it's infrequent. I mean, he can play those kind of over the you know over the top line breaking passes, but it's more few and far between than anything close to being the norm. So I, I think that we do need some type of profile that better fits that. I thought that whenever we signed Hakeem Ziyech, we kind of signed that wide creative player, but Same that's uh yeah we know how that's turned out. So. Mm. Um, I, yeah, I think that that's something long term that will need to be addressed. I mean, the, the chance creation issue is not something that's been born overnight. I mean, this has been season upon season. We've talked about this problem now. It feels like two or three years now. I mean, even even back to Conte's second season, I feel like we had problems creating chances with any type of consistency. So I would favor a, a move for that. And I think that's kind of just goes along with the whole idea of the midfield has to be revamped. I mean, we, we revamped over the past couple of years, the defense, and we've really put a lot of investment in the attack, whether we've revamped it, I think is a whole other question, but we, we really haven't touched the midfield that much. Now, as far as who we sign, what we do, we do have some guys that we did sign that are young. Um, we have, you know, the Carney signing, 
And then we also have uh, the signing of uh, Kasadi, I think is how you pronounce it. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the kid from Inter Milan. So, you know, maybe we'll see what the, I mean, with Carney already getting chances and some minutes already, I mean, let's see what this kid can do. He could be that profile for us. And it actually might make sense if we kind of bring him into that role. I don't really, I'm not too familiar with his game, but just given his age and talent, I think he could be a pretty moldable player for however we want to go. So maybe we already have the answer at home. Maybe we don't, but I think either way, trying to get a better profile like that in the midfield is going to be needed long-term, whoever that is, whether it's internal or external uh, remains to be seen, but I, I think we've, you know, if we summarize kind of what we've been talking about right now, it's been we need a midfield overhaul. I mean, I think that we've we've all kind of been tiptoeing around that for yeah, quite a while sure. now, and we need an overhaul there. I think it's obvious whether when injuries strike, we don't have people that can replace, we don't have the depth we need, we don't really have the roles that we need in that in those areas. So it is somewhere that's going to be long term and short term, you know, kind of the area to address. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. And I think this one. I think we're almost at the end of the stream and I think the Arsenal game starts in like five minutes. So I won't uh, <laughs> keep you guys waiting for too much longer, right? Uh, just a couple more questions. Do you think, and I'll ask this, address this to both of you guys. Do you think we make top four this season? And Chris, you can go first. Uh, I think it will be, it will be tough. Um, I think, I think if we can string a run of performance, I think, well, next two games are crucial. So we win the next two games. I, th- I would feel very buoyant about that because I think we'd be right in the mix um, with a with a chance to kind of have a look at the squad over January and, and come back and hopefully, you know, Reese won't be too far off being fit. Fafana will be back. Um, you know, players can kind of rest those little knots. So, yeah, but conversely, if we lose or we, we pick up one point or or drop points in the next two games. I think we're really going to have our backs against the wall. But that being said, it's a long season. We've got a lot of quality. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we did finish fifth or sixth. Let's put it that way. We could easily finish fourth or third, but it could easily be fifth or sixth. Thanks for fixing. Travis, your thoughts? Yeah, so as, as far as where we're going to finish this season and how it's going to wrap up, I think it's going to be a continually evolving process. I don't think we're going to see massive runs of form. I think we're going to see, you know, highs and lows throughout, with even within months. We're going to have a very congested fixture list. We also have a lot of players going to the World Cup. So there's a lot of factors to think about of how we're going to actually manage these players going forward. And other teams that we're going to be competing with, like Newcastle, are going to have a lot more players sticking around in the World Cup training with the club as opposed to going to the world cup and being exhausted there. So there's another competitive advantage that others might have against us in this top four race. But I I think it's going to be probably it's kind of, it's going to go city and Arsenal. I think get top four this year. And then from there, I think, you know, between third, fourth, fifth, sixth, you've got Spurs, Chelsea, Man United, Newcastle, those are going to, I think those are the most viable contenders for those spots. So you really only are only going to get two of those four where we're going to fall in that right now. I think we're pretty equal to Man United right now. I think that Newcastle uh, look like the team I would pick if we had to pick right now, that's going to finish fourth. Um, not to say that we won't, but uh, just to say that, you know, the, the reality here is there really are only going to be two spots or probably four, possibly five teams. If Liverpool can ever figure things out, which, mm-hmm. Looks, I'm not going to bet on that this season. This kind of looks like the season that yeah. things Transition. do crash a bit yeah. for them. Yeah. But it's going to be a tough battle for us. But I think the the only message I'd have for any any fans listening is that if we don't get top four, it's not the end of the world. As Chris said, oh, sure. we've we've done it before, and many people would argue that that transfer ban and not having top four was actually a positive for the club long term. And I think that when you now have to look back at who we've integrated into the team uh, because of that process, it overall was probably a positive for the club. So it's not like it's the end of the world. If we're not playing champions league football, the Europa league trophy looks cooler in my opinion anyway. So, um, but, uh, but, you know, so I, I, I don't think it's the end of the world. And I think that if we are willing to suffer uh, finishing outside the top four as an actual possibility this season, uh, I think long-term we're going to be better off for it, especially if we stick by the same guy. So It'll be tough. It's going to be a good fight, but uh, it'll be an enjoyable season nonetheless. So whichever mm. way it shakes out. Mm. 
Awesome. And we've just hit the hour mark as well. So I think we had plans to wrap up in 30 minutes, but we had a lot to discuss and this was super, super fun. And thank you so much guys for hopping on. One last question before we drop off and uh, uh, Chris, again to you first. Who do you think wins the World Cup this year? Oh, uh, I think there's there's tournament. There's always good tournament teams, aren't there? So, oh God. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Argentina can do it this year. Um, if you're looking at a team from Europe, Maybe France, if they pull their act together, they've got an unreal squad. Sure. Um, yeah, one of those two. England knocked Travis? out in the quarterfinals. Let, let's make it semi-final. Or, again, <laughs> uh, if, if we get our players back fast, then go out yeah. in the groups. Waste, waste coat or bottle it, mate. Waste coat or bottle it. We'll, we'll do quarterfinals. For sure. Travis, your thoughts? Yeah, so I would say that my favourites are probably, at this point, I'm going to, within Europe, I'm going to probably look at England or... Germany, the France squad seems a little contentious right now for me to pick them. Um, so I, that's that's kind of where I'd go on the Europe side of things. But I also just said another, another friend of mine a couple of days ago that, you know, I think Brazil and Argentina are two to watch out for this year. This is pretty much Messi's last hurrah. So we'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't feel like coming into this season or into this World Cup. I feel like in past World Cups, you know, when I was younger, it was, you know, you had the the dominant Spain squads, you kind of have yeah. these incredible Germany and, and Brazil teams. You could, you had, and then you had like, you know, France, you had clear favorites. I don't really feel like when I look at the state of the world cup teams this year that I'm like, well, that is that, that is the favorite and everybody mm. else is just going to try to be the spoiler. I don't feel that way at all this no. year looking at the teams, but uh, you know, mm. well, it'll, it'll be fun. It's going to be a good world cup. I think if I'm going to pick somebody, I'm going to go ahead and pick Brazil. I think uh, you know, maybe, maybe this is their year. Silva yeah. maybe finally gets that world cup. For sure. I'm going with Croatia because I want Modric to have a World Cup. Ah, well, <laughs> crazy, <laughs> crazy, crazy player, man. And <laughs> cool, guys. I've taken enough of your Sundays and then thank you so much, guys, for doing this. And hopefully, we'll have you on again. Thank you, everyone who tuned in. And Pavan, I totally agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be having a word with you after this, Pavan. <laughs> cool, guys. Thank you so much. Happy Sunday. See you. Thanks. Bye -bye. See you later. Bye.